Good morning. Good morning. Your media of parole is Ubini at um, at LCIW. Uh, I should have known that as uh, Warren Thomas. Uh, good morning. Uh, we're here for a parole hearings today. Um, today is November 30th, 2022, with the personnel at LCIW introduce yourself. Yes, sir. Good morning. Um, I'm Warden Kristen Thomas. Sarah P. A. R. V. C. Manager. Good morning, Pamelia Washington, Record Supervisor. Good morning, Chaplain Debbie Sharkey. Welcome. Uh, we're ready for our first offender. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning. How are you doing, Ms. Willard? I'm good. Uh, we are waiting on some uh, individuals to come into the hearing, and as soon as they enter the room, we'll stop. Thank you. Your full name and your Department of Corrections ID. Neil Sue Willers, 301150. Thank you, Ms. Willers. Uh, my name is Alvin Roche. To my left is Cameron uh, Cheryl Naza, and to my right is board member Bonnie Jackson. We will compose your panel this morning. Let me first of all explain the process to you. I will read some information into the record. Once that information is in the record, we'll conduct a parole interview. At the appropriate time, we'll give Warren Thomas a chance to make remarks, observations, or comments. Then we'll hear from uh, uh, your, your supporters, uh, uh, Andrew Putney from the Louisiana. Parole Project, Mr. Timothy Wilkerson, uh, a mentor, and your mother. Is that Jason? That's my son. Oh, okay. The relationship. Okay. So Jason's your son. And Jason would like to speak. Uh, Mr. Wilkinson would like to speak, and Andrew Hutley will be given a chance to make a presentation. We also have victims in the hearing room. Uh, Mr. Richard Ray uh, would like to speak. Uh, Wayne Paul would like to speak. Uh, Charles Paul would like to speak. And Kenny Paul would like to speak. Now, we have a limit of three persons that like to speak. So, if between me for you, that which three would like to speak? Um, Wayne, Charles, and Kenny. Wayne is my brother. Okay, so again. Okay. I'm in. Okay. 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 Yeah. 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 So, um, Dwayne, Charles, and Kenny will speak, and Richard Ray is here for support. Okay. Well, uh, you are first, Thunder Bender, 
Uh, you currently 70 years old, is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, your parole date is July 29, 2022. You were awarded a commutation of sentence by Governor John Bell Edwards with immediate parole eligibility. Your good time date is March 7, 2038, and your full time date is September 2nd, 2088. Is that information correct? Yes, sir. And I see that you've accumulated 615 days of good time. Ms. Um, will, would you please answer the divine account? She is going to sign your case. Okay. Wonderful. How are you? I'm good. A little nervous. Understandably so. Um, they need to adjust the. There you go. Perfect. Don't move it again. <laughs> no. Thank you. All right, Ms. Willis, your case has been assigned to me, so I'll start questioning for the panel. Uh, I will note that on May 17th of 2017, uh, the parole board made a recommendation to the governor that your sentence be commuted uh, to, uh, to 99 years immediate parole eligibility. I was not on the board in 2017, so I have no personal uh, knowledge of facts of the case. I did not participate in your clemency hearing. And so for that reason, I would like for you to uh, explain to me exactly what happened um, that led to the death of the victim in this case. On August 20th, 1989, I was going to prostitute myself for the first time in my life. I was in Bossier. City, Louisiana, with someone that I shouldn't have been with in the first place, but I was there. And I went out to find someone. We were in an area where this was a common thing that went, went on. I met Charles Parr and brought him back to my motel room to commit the act of prostitution. And he wanted more than what we had discussed. I'm going to be very, very honest and candid. I was going to perform oral sex because I was, um, I'd never been a prostitute or any of those things. Why, why, were you, why were you going to engage in prostitution? I was stranded with my child and my co-defendant. He had taken my automobile, my ID, my credit cards, everything that I had. And when I would try to get away from him, he, he would never let me out of his sight with my child. If I went to the store or went to use the phone, I had to leave my son with him. And on this particular day, it was a Sunday. I had to leave my son with him and go to try to call my father to try to get some help. And I tried several other organizations. When it ended up, it was just the last, it was like in my mind, it was, I had no other choice, but I remember saying to myself, well, you've got to do what you have to do. You can't say, hey, daddy, your daughter's going to become a prostitute today if you don't help her. So I hung up the phone, went back to the room. Well, why were you, okay, I guess I don't understand. Uh, you're, you're, you're not from Louisiana originally, is that correct? Right. How did you end up in Louisiana? Uh, running away from Texas. He was on probation and I was on probation. What were you on probation for? Uh, possession of cocaine. My husband was killed in a tractor accident on our farm in Arkansas. And this man that's my co-defendant uh, became actually a person that terrorized me. And while he was terrorizing me, he became my, uh, the person that I depended on because he would do things in my home and then be there to help me. And I became addicted to him as much as the drug. He helped me with my husband's burial and different things and introduced me to cocaine. And it was just a very brief. Let's, let's, get, back, let's get back to the day uh, that Mr. Forrest uh, was killed. 
So, uh, and I was with him in Louisiana, in Bossier City, and he had, like I said, he had taken everything, everything. And I couldn't, I had money coming in on Wednesday, but we had been evicted from where we were living on Sunday. And I had to have, we had to have money. So it was, Gail, you're going to become a prostitute for the day. And Charles Parr was to be my first, I don't know, client. <laughs> and when I came back with him in the motel room, I had never done anything like this before, ever. And like I said, what I was going to do was what I thought was the easiest thing to do. And when we got there, he wanted for me to take all my clothes off and things. And we got in an argument. And all of a sudden, my co-defendant appeared. And he was not even supposed to be there, much less have my child there. And he was there with my son hiding, I guess, in the bathroom. And he and Charles Parr got in a fight. And it went on and on and on. It seemed like for hours, but I'm sure it was just a few minutes. And Charles Parr actually became my husband for a little while because I had kept my husband alive when he was killed in a tractor accident on our farm. And that was Jerry, my husband laying there and I'm trying to nurse him. And my co-defendant is screaming at me, you better get a life and get a grip, Dale, get a grip, Dale. And then blaming I all of these things. And it was just one thing after another. I did everything that I had to do to just target him. It was a fight between the two men. Oh. Oh. Just a brutal fight. There was no weapons. There was a frying pan that was sitting by the, our door and he was the first to get the pan and they wrestled back and forth with the pan. And uh, it was just a brutal fight between two men. On the cast iron skillet? Yes. And was he beat with a cast iron skillet? He was hit in the head with the, the, the pan. And it was alleged that you were the one who gave your co-dependent the, the skillet to use as a weapon. I didn't. Obviously, you went to trial. Pardon? Went to trial, is that correct? Yes. And the jury heard the facts of the case, is that correct? Yes. And they concluded from the evidence that you were a principal, which means that you were actively involved in the uh, acts that led to the death of the victim. And so you were convicted of second degree murder based on testimony and obviously there had to be some indication that you actively participated in some respects to the actions that led to Mr. Parr's death and it's alleged in the uh, office report that you were the one who gave Ms., uh, the, the co-defendant the skillet that was used to batter the victim. May I speak to that? Please. My son. Mm -hmm. My son testified to that, but I didn't realize that he testified that I gave him the pan. I thought he said that I gave him a stick and hit him in the head with it. And I did so not either, but my son has had extreme emotional problems. He blamed me, he said I killed his father in a tractor accident. You're going a bit far field. Um, Mr. Roche, you wanted to address yes. something? Yes. Uh, in, in error, I misidentified uh, some of the participants. I want to clear up. Uh, we have Mr. Richard Ray, who's a DA. Uh, and would you introduce yourself, Mr. Ray, and tell us what jurisdiction you're from? Sorry, I had to unmute. Uh, thank you, Mr. Roche. My name is Richard Ray. I'm not the district attorney. I'm an assistant district attorney in the 26th Judicial District, which is Bossier and Webster Parishes. I'm appearing today for the district attorney, Skylar Marvin, and I would like to speak if 
if I can. I heard you announce earlier that I was just here for support, but I, I have some brief comments I'd like to make at the appropriate time. And, and you will be allowed to make them at the appropriate time. I just want to recognize you and introduce you. Thank you. Okay. And speaking for the um, um, opposition, it will be Wayne Charles and Ken, Kenny Clark. Exactly. All right. Uh, well, Ms. Willis, we're going to just move forward now. How long have you been incarcerated? Since 1989, 30, 33. And uh, I was reviewing your record. Uh, you've only had four write ups. In 34 years. Uh, you had a write up in 2001, and that was for a contraband. Do you recall what that contraband was? Yes, ma'am. It was a pair of tweezers that were itemized to me. I had an itemized sheet for the tweezers, and when the correctional facility became ACA uh, accredited, they were supposed to have been disposed of, and they were not. They were in a, a piece of article that I had, and in a shakedown, it came out in out of a, a makeup bag or something that I had it in. I can't remember what it was, but it was written up as contraband. And what was your punishment? A suspended sentence of 30 days that I outlived. And it, Also, I see that on 615 days the time uh, of programming that taken. What? I can't understand what she said. I said have earned 615 days of credit. Yes, ma'am. Is that correct? Yes. Were you a, a drug user or an alcohol user back when this crime occurred? You said I was a, you know, I was a, so, so tell us about your drug and alcohol use. I became a cocaine addict when my husband died. My co-defendant introduced me to cocaine, and it was the first oh, thing that ever of you. How often were you using cocaine? At the time of, of my arrest in Bossier, not at all. But when I became an addict, I used Coke for about three months, all day, every day. I'm confused. I thought you said you had a, a cocaine conviction out of Texas. And I, you were Texas. This was all very fast. This was just one thing right after the other. My husband was killed. Ma'am, I'm an addict. Okay, was please try to focus your uh, answers to questions that I'm asked. That's how it, it, I became an addict immediately and it carried over. But at the time in Bossier, there was no drug use, but I still was under the effects of the cocaine. It took years. So uh, what substance abuse programs have you completed since incarceration? I've taken long-term substance abuse. I've also taken substance abuse. Stop talking. What long-term substance abuse program did you complete? It's called long-termers. It was for people that had life sentences or long terms, because at the time that I took it, we weren't eligible to take the other substance abuse programs because they, it was like there was no hope that we would ever be going anywhere. So they called it long-termer substance abuse. I've also taken these substance abuse programs that are offered twice, once before the evacuation and once here, living in balance. I've reiterated and taken it again I'm a mentor and I do these things because I mentor women that have substance abuse problems. So I continue to take the classes over and over again to know what they're doing. 
What is Project Metamorphosis? It was a long time ago. It was actually a program that I helped write some of the, uh, helped develop. It was uh, beginning with a kind of your faith base and finding a new foundation and growing from there like a butterfly it starts out as a, a caterpillar and it turns into a beautiful butterfly. That's why it was named Project Metamorphosis. It was taking something and making it beautiful again, your life. What was the substance of the program? What did you all focus on in the program? Things that lead you to using drugs and sometimes things that trigger things. Also, codependency. You also took victim awareness. Is that correct? Victims awareness? No, I didn't take victims. I don't believe that there's a program called victims awareness. No, it's listed on page 81 of my paperwork showing that you completed victim awareness uh, in 2017. Do you all recall victim awareness? I, victims awareness is a part of the reentry program, but it's not a program in itself. But you took victims awareness part of so the reentry program, yes. Get out of victim awareness. Pardon? What did you get out of that program? <laughs> I became aware of. my victims since way prior to taking this program. Yeah, the program. The program helped me put into words some of the things that I was feeling and some of the things that I'm sure my victims have felt because they have been many. Uh, what are some of the things that you think your victims have been experienced? Anger a heartache, hurt. I think I've created a um, devastation that can never, I can, there's nothing that I can ever do to change that. And I know that they, I've destroyed families. I've destroyed a family of the person that died, that family. I've destroyed my own family. And there's this many victims. And just to, to uh, To say I'm sorry to a victim to me is an insult because how can you say you're sorry when someone's life was taken? And to me, I've learned and I know that life is precious no matter what. And I'm responsible for that. I did not physically do it, but I've been responsible for the death of another human being. And I know that, what can you say to someone? <coughs> What can I do to make that right? Um, what, um, what have you been involved in that would be considered uh, service to other inmates or service to the institution? How have you given back over these 33 years? I began at the very beginning uh, looking and observing what went on in the community. And I decided that I wanted to, although there's nothing that could bring Charles Parr back, I wanted to do something that would make his death mean more. So, from the very beginning, I've tried to invest in the lives of the women around me. I've been involved in every self-help group that LCIW has offered. I've written the several, a couple uh, character counts. I've written a program for a team to team mentoring program for lifers and long-termers. I've mentored and tutored since the big early 1990s. Today I serve as a reentry court and intensive incarceration mentor. I 
the best thing about it is in giving and serving them, I've received more than I've ever been able to give. And I know in my heart of hearts that I have changed the lives of some of the women around me and that, that God has put in my life. I've uh, developed different programs, a magazine, uh, hobby craft sales that offenders are allowed to put their craft in consignment and sell to visitors and to security officers. Uh, just, just about anything that there is here, I've somehow or another been involved in it. Photos, photography, but the most thing, the most rewarding, and I think the most the best thing is the mentoring because oh. Go ahead. there are women who still have a chance that God has placed in my life. And if I've reached one, I've done something, but I know in my heart of hearts, there have been more because the proof has been in the, the my mentees don't recidivate. Well, what can you tell us about um, Ms. Willers? Sure, good morning. Um, Ms. Willer, she's minimum custody status, and like she said, she is one of our reentry court um, mentors, and I think that speaks volumes um, for her character while she's been here and what she's done um, to help some of the other ladies um, actually go back into the community and uh, mentor them and um, assist with some of their different classes and class curriculums. Um, she has been involved in Lifers Association, Toastmasters, and as she mentioned, the Unveiled publication. Um, if she is granted, I know she's been working with parole projects, so she does have um, a great support system if she were to be granted, so. All right, thank you, Warden. Well, let's just talk a little bit about what your transition plan would be if you were to be successful. I know that you will have the assistance of the law project, but that's, you know, that's not long term. That's not, you know, so tell, tell us what your transition plan is beyond the parole project. I have a faith-based community. There are some of the ladies from the church here with me today in Lafayette, Louisiana, that are going to be my long-term support. I also have a son that is willing to support me. And that's one of the most important things in my life is to rebuild that relationship with my son and my family to be a family again, because I've been allowed here to vicariously be a mother and a grandmother to other mother's children and the things that I could never be to my own. And I would like to carry that out to my son and my grandchildren to be able to meet them. But I do have a faith-based community here to support me. I have a job waiting for me. I have a job. Pardon? I have a job. service. At this time, I'm a debt. I'm a you second. Broke up. You broke up. OK. A I'm, she's sitting here, Miss Barbara. She owns a secretarial service. I have a job waiting for me in Lafayette with her. I also have several other job offers. I've had one from here in Baton Rouge at Ideal Markets and some different things. But my skill set, I have great skills because I'm certified an expert in almost all current software applications. And I have a, a forte in building databases. In fact, I've built two for the institution. And I'm not sure if Warden Thomas knows that, but I have. And, digital imaging, and I've been saving. I've saved all of my incentive pay since uh, for years, and I would like to invest in a small digital imaging business of my own. I have a clientele base from my work that I do here already, and I'm very adept in marketing. So I have all the tools needed to be successful. Thank you, um, Ms. Jorshin. Uh, Ms. Woods, I want to give you uh community uh, family a chance to introduce himself. Can we stand the camera one to introduce the guests? Okay. Uh, would you please introduce yourself one by one? Okay. 
My name is Barbara Williams. I'm Barbara's Secretary of Services, where Gail is going to be working from the First Apostolic Church in Lafayette, Louisiana. My name is Peggy Broughton. Uh, this Gail would be living with me until she transitions to another place in Lafayette. Peggy Broughton from Lafayette. Thanks, ma'am. Okay, my name is Stephanie Hills, and I'm the secretary at the Apostolic Church. Oh, my name is Edna Gibson. I served 32 years, and I also worked with Gail when I was here as a mentor. Oh, Lafayette, my bad. Thank you so much for the, for your attendance. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. That's yes, that's uh, our chaplain, Dr. Sharkey. Yes. Uh, Madam Chair, do you have any questions? Uh, at this time, we're going to uh, hear from the Louisiana Parole Project, Mr. Andrew Huntley. <coughs> Thank you, Andrew Huntley, Louisiana Parole Project, appearing on behalf of Gail today to confirm to the board that she is a client of our reentry program. Uh, the and also to clarify that we we ha we do have the capacity to offer Gail long term housing. Um, I, I know that she has opportunities in Lafayette, so uh, she will have as much time as she needs to complete. Uh, the initial transition process with us, uh, whether that takes we, you know, several weeks, several months uh, before her eventual transition to Lafayette. Uh, in that time that she's with us, uh, she will be assigned a case manager uh, and she will go through our intensive reintegration program. We, we will provide her with technological skills or we will provide her with uh, financial management skills. We will assist her with opening a bank account. We will ensure that she has um, mental health counseling uh, and that she has an assessment to determine what her long-term uh, substance abuse or other mental health needs are. And we're gonna work with her to do that follow-up. And uh, during, during that time, uh, she will be housed in safe, stable housing. With our organization, uh, we, we decided to take Gail on as a client, it was a very easy decision based on her record of rehabilitation and achievement during her incarceration. Uh, I, I would say it would be very difficult to find another individual who's done as much as she has uh, to not only rehabilitate herself, but serve her inside community. Uh, what's impressive about her record is she did not start uh, the things that she's done in the last couple of years or even the last 10 years. She's been doing this for the last couple decades uh, in prison. She's a mentor, she's a leader, uh, and we believe that if she's given a second chance uh, that she will be a mentor and a leader in the outside community also. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Huntley. Now we'll hear from the uh, the brother of the victim, Dwayne, Dwayne Parr. Yes, sir. Good morning. Okay. Each, each individual has three minutes to give their presentation. Understood. Uh, first, I want to read you the record. You do have my victim impact statement that was turned in. Okay, thank yes. you. Uh, second, um, the clemency hearing that was held in 2017 we were never notified. Uh, the family were, was never notified of this hearing. Um, we would have showed up in force um, to support uh, my father. Um, not sure how that happened. I've lived at the same place for 17 years, my brother for almost 40. Um, how do you put into 33 years of devastation, collateral damage in three minutes? Um, I relive this every single day. Um, there's no, there's no take backs for me. The, the last. Conversation I had with my father was an argument on that Sunday afternoon. 
And I see his face every day, the disappointment that he saw in me because I was in the middle of my cocaine addiction. Um, I can't get that back. I can't get back having to tell his mother that her last surviving child was murdered. Um, the direct devastation that this was caused and the collateral damage that this has done to our family is immeasurable. I do believe in redemption and second chances. My father was brutally murdered. And I believe if, you, if you're gonna be redeemed, you should be honest about things. And from what I've heard this morning, I haven't heard that, I haven't seen that. Having to relive it and relive it and relive it and relive it has been devastating to me. I turned my life around in 2005. My dad can never come home, never come home. And for the 12 years that I watched his mother slowly die from the results of how this happened and what happened, is gonna be with me forever. I thank you for your time. I strongly oppose any parole or pardon in this case. Thank you. Mr. Paul, for your attendance. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Charles Paul. No, it will be my father with all due respect, Mr. Uh, Roche, but I speak last. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Are you and on? you are Kenny Paul. I'm Kenny, yes, sir. Good morning, y'all. Thank you for allowing me to be here with my father. That's my, my favorite brother. And he lived in Houston, Texas. And we're, and we're looking closer. And I talked to my dad that morning, that Sunday morning. And uh, he knew it up, and I had to go pick some stuff up for him. I was going to meet him back at. His mother's house. He lived with his mother. My grandmother, my son's great grandmother. So she was out of town in Minden with her great sister. And he would be on later, right? My dad said, I'll stop and get some lunch and stuff and tell them we'll watch you all time. We play y'all together all the time. So that was a big deal watching my son together. And when I got, when I got over there, he wasn't there. The car wasn't there, and that's just not the way our father is. So I went and started trying to look for him and see if I could find him. And at that time, I had gotten a call at the hotel where my father killed. And I went over there because my brother and I were born and raised in Bozo City, my dad. We all that's our whole family. So I knew a lot of the police officers in the EMP and stuff. And they had called me. And I went over there and it was my dad. I called my got my brother. But we didn't want my our grandmother to see it on the news of all the new people. We were scared that she would kill her because she had terrible congestive heart failure failure. And uh so my brother had to go out on my way. It didn't come to me. It was my best friend. My father, I was 26 years old, had been married for a few, had a young stepfather, seven. And I had to figure out how to tell that job. She loved him and he loved her. He might be sleeping away. She'd go in there getting off the, the bus and jump up in the bed with him and said, 
Get up, lady. Your face. Get up. We got stuff to do. So, I don't know how I got into the prison. Don't let me throw that. And she had a lot of problems because of that. And it, it's just like my brother said, we relive it every day. 2017, we were not notified. I called the district attorney's office in open prayer with the state before every month for 22 years to make sure that they, Bill Willard and Crandall, were in jail for a jury of their peers sentenced them to that. And we were told in 2007, Crandall didn't appeal as no, no chance of trial and voted. Came in and they said, first and second degree, he'll take second degree, it takes life off the deal. He'll serve, he'll be in jail for the rest of his life, and he will die in jail. And then I get a call three weeks ago from this from Parsons. Saying that Bill Lewis has got one. I have no idea. I don't understand. The DA told us, the attorney told us, and I mean, just we focus me how this happens. And how it how it financially he lived with his mom, my dad did. So my brother and I. And other family members pitched in to take care of our 75 year old grandmother. Who, yeah, just a part failure and lived on $418 a month social security. So financially, it hurt bad. And like I say, my brother was an addict. Well, my brother, I'm very, very proud of him. He's been 20, 17 years. Works at Central Foundation. Greatest facility and program in the world, in my opinion. And my son, right there, Carl, called me Pete Daddy. Never met his grandfather. Mr. Kerry, can you close? I'm going to be right there. Please allow me to listen to this. Thank you. Thank you. And he never met his son. Never saw him. Right away, well, she never saw him. Go to law school at Southern University. Proud of you, but he graduated number one in the class. It's all important stuff to my his grandfather, my dad, our dad, with him just been on the boat and got a dream job at the Cattle District Department Office in Fort Louisiana. First one in their history to hire us right out of law school. Eventually, I'm very proud of him. I'm very proud of my brother. I strongly oppose nothing, no steps, production, or anything for Gail Willis. She hit my dad when he came in the door with a stick and everything. So it was all a setup. I stole his car, jewelry, everything he had, and went to Chicago. They went from Arkansas to Houston and then to Bozeman on the drug ramp and party. What happened? And uh, strongly opposed it. And if for chance that she gets parole, I'm asking y'all for the sake of my family to extend it for at least a minimum of five years. To give us time to go to counseling and, and everything and be get emotional mental health and make sure we're fine and solid. I strongly oppose her going to Lafayette. We have family there. I don't want her anywhere on my own any of our family. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the extra time. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Mr. Charles Paul. Yes, sir. 
morning to this body. Thank you for the privilege of my taking this time to speak. As my father alluded, my name is Charles Kennedy Park, grandson of Charles Ward Park. Three years before my birth, my grandfather was really murdered. The thing is, just like seeing my uncle's reaction, my father's reaction, can't imagine how hard shattered, soul shattering it must have been talk about this. I never knew what happened to my grandfather, except he was murdered. My grand, my father could only muster a single sentence that an explanation. He was robbed and Killed with cats and I kill it, son. So, how did I find out the gruesome facts behind my grandfather's murder? My second year of law school, I was studying an evidence procedure. I read my textbook, State of Louisiana versus James Brain. I read the facts of how my grandfather was murdered. The cell that gave initiated. The second my grandfather walked in that door, Brandon was in front of him, gave him behind him. She hits him behind the head with a big stick, knocks him down, and then she proceeds to hand him James the cast iron skill. I was frozen. I, it was an out of body experience reading the facts for the first time. And I know the son is here again. The only thing I have to say to him is I thank you. You were five years old at the time. You testified. It was your testimony that wound up being the driving force that allowed justice to be held on that day as a release of Gail. To hear them laughing, laugh after my grandfather saw the floor, blood, tied him up. A jury of, the, of her peers and pick a girl was actual basis, and you hear that completely dispute that she, she disputed now, she disputed back in her clemency here. Disingenuous of refusal to take accountability and accept what you convicted of. Her role as a part of this justice system, I do believe that she can learn to turn themselves around and confirm their demons in their past. Gail has not been that, has not been. I'm the first generation of my uh, generation of attorney in my family. After reading the facts that I did on that day, my second year of law school, that was my inspiration for becoming an attorney, not to see attorney, but prosecutor. So that families, they come after me and experience the same tragedy. If not, God will be worse. They have, I can help them. Achieve some sense of justice, not just a conviction, but past that. There's always a silver lining of the tragedy, and that was mine. I can only request and make you know, my strong opposition to get over being granted for all. Because the first time my grandfather's ever going to get to meet me. My first children is when God calls me. It's my time to go. So I urge this body. Please, I beg you, let me try to remember you. Do not grant this to me. She did not deserve me such a privilege. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we're going to hear from this. Mrs. Woods' son, Jason. Jason? Hello. Jason? Well, well, I'm going to introduce you to Jason. Uh, yes, you sir. Give you give us your state. Okay, so after having listened to this, I had wondered what I was going to say. The reality of it is there's a lot of facts. A lot of people lost family. I lost a mom. My grand, my daughter lost a grandmother. They lost a father. 
and a grandfather and, and nothing's going to take that back. I mean, there is nothing that undo undoes that. The, where I stand is I, I've not lived a, a good life, but I know that there was everybody involved in this altercation was all in the wrong. My mom was in the wrong. The person was in the wrong. What people don't know is I met the co-defendant and he was not a good person. I don't find it in any way unreasonable to believe that he caused this to happen. I was 15 years old. I remember when my mom left this house because I still own the property. I feel without a shadow of a doubt that she has done good for people. I believe she will do good. And long-term speaking, I have three houses. She always has a place to live. And it doesn't have to be in Louisiana if the family feels impacted because I feel for them. I, I get it. I understand it wholeheartedly. I do. And it's not going to change the fact. I just honestly, sincerely believe that she deserves her family also. My, my daughter would love to meet her. My daughter who's 18, going on 18, fixing to graduate. So yes, everybody lost. And I'm sorry for that. And that's that's all I have to say. Thank you, Jason. At this time, yes. from Timothy Wilkinson, please up right and give us your presentation. Thank you. Um, indeed, my name is Tim Wilkinson, and I met Gail Willers uh, in 2005 after her incarceration began. Um, uh, Gail immediately at that time strike me as a, as a very humble, very remorseful, giving, kind-hearted person. Um, th this, this entire case is a, is a, is a tragedy. We, we, we all know that. Um, and, but what I can say uh, about her and her willingness to give and to be of help to the people in her community uh, supersedes any... Um, any other offender at Louisiana Correctional Institute for Women that I encountered during that time. Uh, at that time, I spent a lot of time at the women's prison because uh, we were actually uh, helping Gail uh, uh, start a magazine over there to get the word out. She has told many people's story uh, and she puts a lot of folks before herself. Um, she's a very good woman. Uh, listening to Jason speak, I, I was very humbled because you know, I, 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 she has spoken to me timeless times about, you know, the effects of uh, the decisions that she made years ago and how it affected not only uh, the victim and, and his family, but um, her family as well. Um, she is, um, she is, she's definitely worthy of, of a second chance at 70 years old, in my opinion, because of her, you know, what she has done um, to try and redeem herself. As she said, and she said it best, you know, the words, I'm sorry, just definitely, they, they, they won't bring back a life. And, 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 it's, and it's so very unfortunate. But if she could, I'm absolutely certain that, that she would. I'm here in Baton Rouge. Yeah, I've known Gail since 2005. We keep in contact. Uh, Andrew Hunley and I talk all the time. She knows that I'm definitely here to support her in any way. Uh, that that I can to help her uh, uh, reintegrate into society if this board deems it um, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilkerson. Uh, Attorney uh, Ray, would you like to close out the uh, presentations? I'm sorry, Mr. Roche. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. I know my time is limited, so I'll be brief. Uh, good morning. Thank you for allowing me to participate on behalf of uh, the Bozier Webster district attorney's office and district attorney, uh, Skylar Marvin. Uh, I was not one of the prosecutors on the case, uh, when it was, when it was tried, but Mr. Marvin was involved in it and prosecuted it and has briefed me, uh, but I'm going to try to limit the facts and the things that I talk about today. They're included in the 2017 uh, clemency investigation that was done by probation and parole, uh, apparently ahead of her clemency 
uh, matter that was held in 2017. Uh, but I, I'm going to limit the facts to that. And I would encourage each of you, if you have not reviewed it, to review it because I, I think you're not getting the complete story of what happened back on August the 20th of uh, uh, 1989. Uh, I was in college at the time and I remember this incident. Uh, the, the community here in Bossier City definitely remembers it. Uh, unfortunately, death and murder have become commonplace in a lot of areas, but not in Bossier City. But this was a particularly heinous and, and horrendous crime. Uh, Mr. Parr was brutally beaten and uh, was not even beaten to death, was beaten and then left to die stuffed in a closet uh, when Miss Willers and, uh, and her co-defendant fled. Uh, they did all of this in front of Miss Willers eight-year-old child. And this was a setup. This was, this was, they lured him in there to rob him and to kill him. And the record reflects that Miss Willers was an active participant in this murder. She was not this passive bystander who tried to render aid to this person that she cared for, as she tries to uh, say that she is today. Uh, the record reflects that she was an active participant. The jury found her to be an active participant and a principal. Uh, Charles Park died as a result of his injuries, including swelling to the brain. And her own son testified that she hit him in the back of the head or hit him in the head with a stick when he came in the room. Then he was tied up. And this is all from her son's testimony. Who she, all of this was done in front of him, that he was taped up and that Miss Willers handed the handed the cast iron pan to Mr. Crandall. And Mr. Crandall used that used that to bludgeon him uh, in this brutal event. Uh, this was not a person trying to stop a murder. She participated in the murder and the jury found her to be a principal. Uh, Charles Parr was stuffed in the closet and left to die. But Miss Willer's involvement did not end there. They stole what he had on him. They took his car. Miss Willer's actively uh, uh, participated in the cover up of the murder. And this is all from that 2017 clemency investigation. Miss Willers cleaned the room. She helped wipe the wipe the blood off the walls and off the mirrors. And then after the murder, they stole Mr. Uh, Parr's car and fled to Chicago. Her own son testified that on the way, Miss Willers threw the bloody sheets that they had taken out of the window on their way to Chicago. When they got to Chicago, they told people in Chicago that they were running from the law because they had murdered a man. And this is all in probation and parole 2017 investigation and in the record. Uh, she was sentenced to life in prison and then somehow commuted to 99 years. Uh, but to release her on parole uh, after serving such a relatively small portion of, of a life sentence or a 99 year sentence is a gross injustice to this family that you've heard from. And it only makes their suffering worse. Uh, our office and Mr. Marvin uh, would strongly oppose any parole uh, for Miss Gail Willers. And, and one other thing, I'm sorry, Miss Willers in 2017, I listened to the recording of the 2017 clemency hearing that I was recently uh, provided. And in 2017, she said, I'm as guilty as, as he is, meaning Mr. Crandall. And the jury agreed with her. She seems to be taking less responsibility now than she did in 2017, but she still seems to take almost no responsibility and no uh, responsibility for her clear active participation in this brutal murder. Thank you. Hey, Ray, I have a question. Yes, sir. Is there any indication how long the victim was in the hotel room before he was found? Uh, I don't have that, Mr. Roche, because I was not one of the prosecutors. I, 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 I just don't know and wouldn't want to speculate, but I know that the report and the 2017 report shows that he was he died of heart failure that was caused by swelling of his brain. And so it's 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 inferred, certainly, that he that he stayed in that closet for some period of time and and, and probably died a very, a very slow and probably painful death. But I personally, I'm not sure how long he was there before he was discovered. I believe it was by the hotel staff. Uh, probably within 24 hours or the next day, but that would just be, I, I, I don't know that for a fact. 
Ray, Ray, thank you uh, for your attendance. You have uh, supplied some vital information. Thank you very thank, much. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Woods? Yes, sir. Would you like to make a closing statement? Yes. Everything said here today is true. Uh, I am responsible, and I've never, ever, ever, ever said that I'm not, because I am definitely responsible. I know that had I not been doing what I was doing that day, Charles Power would still be alive today, and I've always been accountable from day one. I've mourned his death along with his sons. I've mourned the devastation and the havoc and everything that I've created in everyone's life, theirs, my children's. I am responsible. I've tried in everything in my power to give back and do something to make that death worth something, to make it mean more. And again, I can't say that I'm sorry because it means nothing to say you're sorry. How can you say you're sorry to people like his sons and his family? If I could bring back his life, I would. I would have done it a long time ago and I, I am accountable. I thank you for hearing me today and for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Wood. I'm ready to vote. Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm in the executive session. I'm second. Uh, it is probably moved and seconded that we have an executive session to talk about confidential matters. We will adjourn a few minutes and then come back with decision. I feel now could be a good time to jump in. What do you think they're going to decide? Um, yeah, it's like a monstrous crime. And it, uh, you know, it seems that it was influenced by drugs, of course. But has there been enough time served? Has she been honest to the board? You know, from one side, it's like you hear from the family and hear about the crime and it's just, no, you gotta serve your time. And then on the flip side, it's, uh, do you think the person's gonna do it again? Have they served enough punishment and are, are they at a chance of being dangerous to society? I think that's ultimately what the board's going to have to decide here, right? It's always interesting to come up with what you think the decision is before having the board give it and then share, share why. So always an interesting thought experiment. It's not often that they take these executive sessions. So that that is, uh, sometimes they're checking like facts. They, they need to look over documents. Um, and they're, they're typically pretty quick though, just a few minutes. Definitely, can you imagine what she's going through right now? It's like the anxiety, I can't even imagine. And then what the victims are going through. 
And there's something that I always hear. It's I oh I think it's like always. I'm not sure if I can think of a case where they don't. And that's where the victim says, I wish I could take it back. If I could, I would. And that saying just is, it seems so hollow, but yet we hear it, I think virtually all the time. And I don't know why people say it. Now, I, I, I guess from one aspect, it's, it's the truth, right? Like, course they would take it back uh like freaking you know like you're in this is you you wrecked everything for everyone but the reason but i just don't get why people say it because it's such a meaningless it's so meaningless like what's the alternative Mm, i was happy i did it now i don't want to take it back i feel like there, there just has to be how does someone What does someone say in a situation where they did something so horrible, like murder someone in front of a child, nonetheless, in front of a child? I think it, it, I think in this scenario, it just has to be, I have a drug rattled brain that wasn't functioning on the level of a human mind. I I, I was turned into an animal. Like something more, it's just something more substance and I wish I could take it back if I could, I would. Okay, yeah, thanks. I, I hear it all the time. I don't get it. There are a lot of things in life that I do wish I could take back. Like, like there's this thing, like, don't regret anything. And, but I, there are plenty of things that I regret. And I, I, I guess there's a certain point it's about wrapping your mind around certain decisions and coming to terms with the decision to grow from the decision, or then maybe you can, authentically say I don't regret it if you've come to the place where you have grown as a person because of it Um, and then I guess that's a healthy full circle of saying I don't regret but certainly I would have regret for things I wish I had done there are certain things I wish I would have done, whatever it might be, right? And then you can say the same thing for that. Well, come to acceptance for um, – and it doesn't need to be like a wrong decision versus a right decision. It's, it's just that fork in the road decision. You know, those life choices, what if you would have – taking this job or not. Versus even not, versus doing a mistake, but just not doing something, right? You should have um, done that gap year or traveled or, like certain things I wish I would have done before I settled down. I wish I would have traveled the world. Like, I wish I would have done that. So, can I say I regret not doing it? I think so. Do I lose sleep over it or beat myself up over it? No, but I wish I would have traveled the world. I like the idea of traveling on sleeper trains. I've never done that, but man, it seems so like such a Zen way to travel. Um, Let's see how much more time there is. Maybe I'll speed it up. 150. Yeah, I can speed it up a little bit. I think I think I've done enough talking. Okay, here we go. Here we go.
And the committee of flow is called to order. We'll be back in session. Time is 10.08 a.m. Ms. Woods? Yes, sir. All family, this was a very difficult case for the board. We have talked and we we're ready to make a decision. Are we ready to vote? Board Member Jackson. All right. Um, first, I'd like to say to the Carr family, um, your, your pain is obvious in how poor I am. I also want to say that when we take that, I was a judge for 28 years. And so when we went on executive session, which want to be transparent, you want to get the opinions of your, you want to share your thoughts. And I don't like to make decisions off the cuff. Ooh, careful, please. Okay, I'm sorry. It was, it was almost like a jury deliberating. I needed to hear thoughts of my fellow board members and they needed to hear thoughts. So, I always uh, believe in training and to let you all know why we do the things that we do. Uh, as Mr. Roche said, this was a very, very, very different case. The facts of the case were absolutely horrible. I'm not going to try to shoot the coat in, in any way. Uh, but what I will say, uh, when cases get to this, Point. They're all bad. They're all bad. That's right. Had a child murdered, you know, as a year old, and he was all beaten. So they're all horrible. There, there are no good cases when you have these kinds of hearings. And so I don't want you all to think in any way that I'm minimizing. Uh, the seriousness of what happened to the thing. Uh, Ms. Willis, I really wish that when I asked you about the facts of the case, I really wish that you had been more honest with uh, the board, but really more honest with yourself. And I think, you know, had you been able to acknowledge fully what you've done, that would certainly have gone a long way with maybe helping this family move forward. But I also understand because I've been on this board now for um, about a year and a half, and sometimes offenders do have difficulty admitting to themselves what they've done because what they did was so horrible that they rewrite history in their own mind, they create their own narratives. And I think that's what you've done today. Uh, but our role as a parole committee, and I, I wasn't on the board when your clemency was granted. I, 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 I didn't know anything about that. But I do know the principles that we operate and we take into account a lot of different things. We take into account the crime itself. We take into account the harm done uh, as a result of the crimes. But we also have to look at the person, the individual, who that person is today, and whether or not that person is a different person than they were 33 years ago. And as I looked at your record uh, within the institution, it's been exemplary uh, to only have had four disciplinary write-ups in 33 point plus years is exemplary. Your last write-up was over 21 uh, years ago. That's also exemplary. What we look at is what programs have you done to work on yourself as a human being? And you've taken a lot of those programs. But one of the most um, 
important things for me is what has been done to help others. It's one thing to work on yourself and to help yourself, but I find it impressive when you've done things to help others. And you apparently have done a lot to help others. One of the women in the room with you today apparently had been an inmate with you and you mentored her and she's now on the outside and she's involved in church and she's doing good things with her life. And so I look at all of those things. I also look at the fact that the previous board saw fit to recommend clemency. And then the governor's office always does its own investigation of the person before they sign off, before the governor signs off. And there have been recommendations that the governor has not signed off on. And having been on this board and know, knowing how seriously uh, we all take our responsibilities, I respect the fact that this board in 2017 uh, soft fit to recommend clemency. And I would like to just clear up for the record, this is in no way a criticism of the Park family, but our victim assistance office worked very, very hard because victim impact is very important to us. And there were comments offered by the family in 2017. They were written comments in 2017. Uh, so I know that the, the victim coordinated a very good job. And you wouldn't believe the list they go to the locate people. But with all that being said, uh, because you were recommended for commutation, because the governor's office did sign off on it, and because of your um, Simply work for helping other inmates. My vote today would be to grant your parole with a condition, uh, Ms. Willers, that you remain with the parole project in Baton Rouge for a minimum of one year, and then you reside. Uh, what state does your son live in? Texas. You reside in Texas with your son, that you are not to turn to Louisiana, you're not to go to Lafayette, you're not to go to Shreveport, Bossier area. Upon your transition from the Louisiana Fall Project, you are to go to Texas to live with your son. I'm just one vote, uh, Mrs. Ms. Willers, but that's my vote. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Mrs. Renazzi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Willers, I was on your uh, on the board in 2017 for us and I was for you then. Uh, based on the work that you've done, I noted at the time that you started that work early on in your uh, incarceration. So you really, really worked on you and, and uh, provided assistance to others. So my vote today also is to grant with the same special that Ms. Jackson has articulated. I would like to add that you're to have no, absolutely no contact with the victim's family. Ms. Ward, you have to sit close to grant your request. Ms. Ward, I said on the panel that I granted you clemency. I don't remember whether or not I voted for you, but some of the facts about today were wrong. The testimony read by the DA's office shed more light on this case than I think I had at the time of the pardon hearing. You have adamant opposition 
the DA's office, the sheriff's office, the chief of police, all of adequately opposed. I always think that the first step for rehabilitation is to take full responsibility for your actions. You did not do that today. You said you were responsible, but I expect you to say you had a major part in the crime that was committed. A jury of your peers decided that it and convicted you. I heard testimony from the DA's office that prosecuted some facts I've heard for the first time. A lack of responsibility, adamant opposition from law enforcement and the rest of the people community, and vehement opposition from the victim's family. My vote is to deny your request for early release. Staff, is she eligible for keeping the book? You are eligible for a two thirds vote. By a vote of two to one, your early release has been granted. You have a good day. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my God. Oh. Yeah, just letting that sink in. Um, I, for some reason, didn't think that the two thirds vote would work in this case. You know, it's looking at the victim's, the victim's son, the son's face and just seeing how upset he is that uh, it always makes me just lean towards the victim. Thank you. <laughs> When I see the when I see that, um, he obviously didn't want her out. This was the first time, and you know, if you if you go back to Miss Jackson's uh, statement, how she's been doing this for so many years as a judge, and that the victims often recreate the scenario. And I heard some of uh, um, my subscribers had said this in the comments. And then to use that as the justification for why she wasn't truthful. And to me, that's a little, it's kind of like you're picking and choosing because you're, you're, you're saying it's okay that you weren't truthful because I believe that you have reimagined the reality so therefore I'll grant you versus just lying. But to me, that's no excuse. And Mr. Roche, I think he hit it on the head. He's like, you came in here and you weren't truthful. You need to take accountability. You can't make up an excuse. That means that the whole time they're, the, their acts are, no, you have to take accountability. You did it, admit to it, sit with it, live with it. And then take that and move forward. You shouldn't, I just disagree with Ms. Jackson in the sense that like if we want to justify in our minds and make someone out to be less of a bad person, sure. You know, that's how we can say why they would come out. Because I would say, why would you come out and lie? It's not going to help your cause. That's just dumb, right? You've spent all this time in prison. You're about to get out. The governor agreed to commute your sentence to 99 years. You knew that this was coming. You had a hearing before. You know what you need to do. And then you're going to come out and lie. Now, the, the on the flip side, Ms. Jackson's like, well, she thinks it's the truth. But then if you think it's the truth, then you truly haven't accepted your responsibility. 
You shouldn't get out then. You know, it's the most basic part. Forget how great you, if you don't accept responsibility for what you did, then you're actually like blank, like then in your mind, you're part, you're not as guilty. It should be a requirement. If you can't accept what you actually did and you're still in denial about it, I agree with Mr. Roche. And I disagree with Ms. Jackson. And that's oftentimes it's the other way around. But she's getting out. She's getting out. Love to hear your comments. Love to hear your comments. What's that noise?